Well, hey, thank you guys again for being here. Uh, we are starting a new series on uh, the book of James. And so uh, what this is, is we're going to walk through the book of James together. Um, this is an awesome opportunity. Uh, we just got out of Family Matters. That was an amazing series that we just walked through. I hope God blessed um, families in so many different amazing ways. But um, Going through books are, are different because we're just taking God's word and we're going to dig into it. We get to go a little deeper. We get to learn more. This is a learning experience for me as well, um, for Pastor Josh, as all of us get up here and preach. Like We're learning things as we go along as well that maybe we haven't seen before in God's word. And so I want to encourage you today, just lean into this. Uh, lean in and know that God might have something new. Maybe you've read, I've read James 50 times. It's like, hey, God never stops working, right? So let's, let's be uh, expecting that he wants to do something new in our lives today. No matter how many times we've gone over this, I think he wants to do some good stuff. So let's do it. Uh, to start out, I want to give you some background, okay, on the book of James, okay? Just, just some context because context is key. Uh, it's so important for us to know what was happening at the time that this was written, what all's going on, who this person that wrote us this letter is, all that stuff, um, so that we can better understand what God is trying to do here and in our lives. And so uh, just a few things. I want to give you the who, the when, the why, and then a big point about the reason behind the context. And so the who uh, is who wrote this letter. Uh, so the book of James is written by obviously... Paul. Oh, wow. Just kidding. Okay. Yes. James. Gotcha. Um, imagine that. That's like an M. Night Shyamalan, you know, twist right there. Okay. Uh, it was James. Okay. James wrote this. Uh, James is believed to be the half-brother of Jesus. There's weird controversies about that, but that's what most people would say is he is Jesus's half-brother. Uh, and he actually wrote this when uh, it's believed that he wrote this somewhere between the years AD 40 and AD 60. Okay. And he is writing to, okay, the why behind this letter is he is writing to God's people who are at this time are scattered abroad in so many different places uh, and are being persecuted right now for their, their following and their belief in Christ. Uh, and so he's writing this letter to them as an encouragement, as just a, a, a continuation of like, hey, while we're in this season, here's what we need right now. Here's what we need from the Lord. Here's what we need to be doing as followers of Jesus, as believers in the Messiah. Um, here is this for all of us in this really rough season, a trial truly is what they're going through. And so um, the big point that I really want to get from all this, though, is that uh, when James is like writing this letter, there's all, obviously all of Scripture is just powerful, and there's, there's great things about it. But something that's interesting about James is, is his history with Jesus. Like I said, believed to be the half-brother of Jesus. And so um, for James, his story and his, his belief and his his being sold that Jesus is the Messiah is a little different than most because, again, Jesus is his half-brother. So I don't know if any of y'all got siblings in here, but if somebody came up to you and said your sibling was the son of God and you know your sibling, <laughs> no, sir. Like, if somebody came up to me, not, they're going to get mad at me, but if it was like, hey, one of your siblings is going to be like the president, I'd be like, you're tripping. Yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, like, you got James over here who literally has been with Jesus, you know what I mean? And it's like, and got to see him grow up. It's like, maybe Jesus was kind of annoying. He's perfect, but maybe he got on James. You're like, what, did you just say Jesus was annoying? He's like, but maybe he got on James's nerves. You get what I'm saying? It's like, maybe that's how James felt about him. It's like, not uh, us. We're like, that's baby Jesus. You know what I mean? It's like, never. But he got to experience all of that. And so, again, this is just an assumption from our part, but we, we've got to give James the benefit of the doubt that he struggled for a while to fully go, hey, I'm sold. That, that my half-brother, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and that he's changing everything. But the good news is, is that eventually that day came, and actually it's believed that when, James, when Jesus was resurrected, he showed up to all these people, and one person that he went directly to was James. And we believe it's because of that struggle that James had that he had to come to his brother and go, hey, check it out. I'm back, you know? And from that moment on, James was sold. James was like, all right, I'm, I, you're right. You know what I mean? Like, let's keep moving. I believe you. Let's, let's, go, let's go save everybody. Let's go change the world. And so James moved forward. And, and again, my, my reason for explaining all of that is because when James jumps into this letter here, when he writes this letter, he's not afraid to just shoot you straight. Like, he's not afraid to just, just give it to you real quick and hit you hard and be like, here's what needs to happen. Here's what's going on. Um, it's, it's, he, he pours out wisdom here to, to, to his people. He wants to share with them all the things that they need to be doing and knowing, and, and he's not afraid just to tell you like it is. And so as we walk through this scripture, we're going to see some of that. Um, and I think it's important to know that because, again, this comes from a guy who struggled and finally came to a place where he said, I'm sold. So there's some power behind these words that he has. Amen? 
All righty. Well, let's get into it. So we're going to start, and again, we're just going to read through, um, I'd say, majority of the Scripture in the first 15 verses and kind of see what God is doing in those. And so start in verse 1, uh, James 1, verses 1 and 2. If you've got your Bibles, I am uh, going to preach out of the NIV today. So, um, But this is all up on the screen if you don't have uh, a Bible with you. But just follow along with me right now. So James verse 1, James 1, 1, James, a servant of God, introducing himself and of the Lord Jesus Christ, writing to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. What's up? Consider it pure joy. Okay, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Let's stop right there. (laughs) So James starts out by telling us, hey, when life is crappy, be happy. You know what I mean? That's how, that's, <laughs> it, can, it can really feel that way. First, I told you, James, go and give it to you. You know, he's coming at you. It's quick. He's like, hey, here's what you need to know. When life gets hard, you better get your smile on. That's how it can feel when we read this, okay? Some of you are like, you ever had those moments when you like open scripture? People open to James. Like, I just feel like the Lord's leading me to James today. James 1, they read, consider it pure. Did I say James? I meant John. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, this is one of those moments. We read that verse and it's, it's just not what we were hoping for. It's not what we were expecting. Uh, it's, it's not what we wanted. That, can we be real today, church? We don't like that. When we start, when that starts off that way and the Bible hits, because, oh man, God does that a lot through his word. But when he gives you that thing that's like, here's some truth for you. He's like, that is not what I needed. I needed butterflies and rainbows and all those things and blessing. <laughs> but that's not what's happening here. We don't like this because I don't know about y'all, but trials, when I go through trials, the trials I've experienced in my life, they're hard and they're not fun. In fact, they're, they're so hard that it is almost impossible sometimes to even experience any amount of joy. You ever been there where things are just hard? Some are different than others, but we've all got our stuff that we face. We've all got our things, our moments, our seasons that we go through, and they're hard. So when James comes in, Mr. James over here says, hey, consider it pure joy when you experience trials of any kind. You're like, James, you don't know what you're talking about, man. What are you, what are you doing here, James? What, what is this? We don't like it. There's a, a movie, and maybe I think a lot of us have seen it. It's an old Adam Sandler movie called Click. Anybody in here ever seen Click, right? Uh, so you're like, me and Ami, I was praying when it came out. But um, so Click, in the movie, the whole kind of concept is you've got this family man, and he, you know, he's a hardworking dude, got an amazing family, but life has struggles. And uh, he comes across this, like, magical remote, right? Should have brought a remote with me, but he comes with this magical remote, comes across it. And whenever things get hard, what he does with that remote is he just decides, hey, you know what? This is hard. I don't want to deal with it. So guess what? Skip, and he fast forwards. You guys know what I'm talking about? He fast forwards through those trials, just goes on. It's like, whew, wakes up, and it's like, wow, it's all gone. It's all better. You know what I mean? And so, so he thinks, right? And he keeps doing that, keeps doing that, keeps doing that, keeps doing that, and he just gets to skip through all the hard times that life throws his way. Sometimes we like to do that, or we wish we could do that. We wish we had our own magical remote that when times get hard, we could just go, and it's done. And we're like, oh, thank God. That was awful, even though I didn't have to experience it, you know? Like, wouldn't that be nice? We hope for that, though. We would love for that to happen. Can we be even more real? We kind of already do that. When trials come our way, and again, I don't know about y'all, but I've done this thing where if something gets really hard, I go on autopilot. If there's something in life that's happening that's so tough that I'm just like, man, I, I just can't handle this. What I do is I make the decision that I'm just going to survive through this season. And I kind of shut down. There's no drive. There's no motivation. There's no like, I'm going to, it's going to be good. It's it's just like, this is so bad. This is so hard that I'm just going to get through it. And I'm on autopilot and I survive through that season until it's over. Nothing is fixed. Nothing. I just get through it. Some of you are like, what's wrong with that? (laughs) Well, if you watched the movie or if you've been in that position before like I have, you know that you come to the end of that, and the more you do it, the more you, are, you look back and you realize, wow, all these things have changed and happened in my life, and I didn't get to experience them. There were all these good things, maybe with my kids, with my family, with my work, with whatever it may be, that because the season that they were happening and were so hard, I missed out on those things as well. There were good things in the midst 
of those hard times, those bad times that I missed out on because I just wanted to speed through them. I just wanted to get through them and be done with them. You ever been there? Amen. It's a very real place. We've been there, church. We, we do that. We press fast forward. What we're doing in those times is we're prioritizing the destination and not the journey. We're choosing that the destination is the most important thing and that the journey means nothing. Can I tell you that's the wrong mindset today? That God has so much for us in the journey, in those seasons when life is hard and he's like, hey, don't miss this. He, he's not saying that those seasons are all happy-go-lucky and that they're good and that we're just being wimps and we need to get over. No, 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 God understands those seasons are hard. He knows, he gets it. And he's not saying to suck it up, but he's just saying, don't miss it because he might be trying to do something really big in those seasons. So we can't just fast forward to him. It's not the way that God has called us to face our trials in the past today or ever. God has a different plan for us, a plan to do different things in a different way. And so maybe you're in here like, I get what you're saying again, pastor, but man, those trials are hard. Like you don't know what I've experienced. Hey, I, I don't but I know what I've experienced and I know that it's been hard. We all know what we've experienced and we all know that it's hard. So the question then is, is how do we do this? How do we get to this place that James is telling us that we need to be in where when, when things get hard, we're, we're not overwhelmed. We're not just autopilot. We're not zombied out and just like, I'm gonna get through. I'm just surviving. But instead we're saying, hey, I'm gonna live in it and I'm gonna consider it pure joy. We're, how do we get to that place where we believe that God's gonna do something different in here? What I wanna do today is like I said before, we're going to walk through uh, this first passage, this first section of scripture in James. And I believe there's three things, okay, the, the three things that God has laid in my heart for us to know today that can help us when trials come along and can help us to have the strength to truly consider those seasons as pure joy and not just the bad things. It's not just a negative season. It's not just the worst things, but to let God do what he wants to do in those seasons. So three big things um, and again, back to James. When James goes through, he's going to hit us with hard stuff, okay? He's going to give it to us quick, and he's gonna, just going to tell us, here you go. Here's what this is. So you're going to have to stick with me, lean in, um, because we got to figure out how we can go to saying, I consider it pure joy because. And so the three things that we've got, we're going to start in verse 1, uh, or verse 2, excuse me. So James 1, verses 2 through 4. Uh, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Here's the first point, okay? First point. If you're taking notes, write this down. First point is God is working in us. In our trials, in the seasons that we go through that are very, very hard, one of the ways that we can help ourselves to believe and know and consider these seasons as pure joy and all that we face is that God is working in us in us in those seasons. Again, back to, to end of verse three in verse four, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. God has started a work in us, okay? And this is a work that he continues to work out for forever. He's making us and building us into the people that he has called us to be. He's got amazing plans for us. And one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna get in the way of perseverance because things get too hard. We wanna get in the way and we wanna stop the work that God is doing but we're not called to do that. We're called to get out of the way and we're called to let perseverance finish the work it's begun, to let God keep working in us to become the people that he has called us to be. And that's what James is telling us right now. God is working in us. Is anybody in here like going to the gym? Like you just, like you love being at the gym. Okay, I like it. First service, nobody raised their hand. I was like, y'all a bunch of liars. You know what I mean? Because I see some of y'all come in here, you know, it's like, got your schmediums on. No, I'm just kidding. It's a real thing. I say that because, uh, yeah. Um, I get it. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, like, so the reason I bring this up is like, I had a season, <laughs> just a season, where I also enjoyed going to the gym. Not really. But I had a season where I was going to the gym, a few of them. <laughs> um, but I want to tell you about this one. And specifically, it was beginning of last year. 
uh, I, had a, I have a friend named Pat. Pat used to attend Grace Fellowship Church. Uh, he lives in Oklahoma City now. He, he was up here. If Pat used to look like Captain America, or he does look like Captain America, okay? You guys, some of y'all know Pat. Like, the dude is just built, man. You know what I mean? He's got, the, like, the little comb over. He is Captain America, and he's just hiding there from everybody. But he's built, man. Like, I remember one time we were, and this is so funny, man. It's like we were swimming together at, like, a, some, like a, I can't remember, it was somebody's birthday party or something like that. And, like, uh, Pat was there, and, like, Tanner, you know, I remember Pastor Tanner, love Pastor Tanner. Tanner and I were swimming, you know, we got our little, our little dad bods going on. And then you see Pat, man, and he comes in the pool, and he's just like a 20-pack and huge muscles, and you're like, I just like sunk in the water. It's like, <laughs> what is going on? So anyways, that moment I knew I was like, I got to get like that, you know what I mean? It's like, and, and, and I'm being silly, but like truthfully, it's like, got to take care of ourselves, got to prioritize our health. We want to be able to do the things that God has called us to do, and, and our physical health is a part of that. And so um, I knew I had to make some changes and, do, and make healthier habits, and so I asked Pat to help me. He was actually looking for a gym partner at the time, and so it worked out. And so beginning of last year, we started going to the gym together, and it was, I mean, it, it was awful. <laughs> um, I, so here's the thing. We, started, we, would, we met like three or four days. I want to say four days a week, um, and we were consistent. Woke up at like, we got there at like 6 a.m., and went every, every like other day in the morning. Um, I hate waking up that early. It's really hard. Uh, and then I had to start changing my diet. I love cereal. It was really hard to stop doing that. Um, and then like, we're just lifting things, heavy things. <laughs> it's like, this is not cool, man. You know what I mean? And on top of that, the gym that we were going to, all they play is like 80s hair band, like music. So I'm just, you know, it's like, every road. All right, come on. You know what I mean? It's just like, what is this? So it was just tough, man. Like, I did not enjoy it one bit. But I knew I had to make healthier decisions. And so I kept going, was consistent, consistent, consistent. Did it for like a month and a half. Finally got to a place where it was like, I, I was at home one day. And my brother David was living in Lawton at the time. And he was at our house. You know, I must have had like a tank top on or something like that. But I'm walking around and I walk in and David's like, bro. Like, you're looking good, man. Like, you look like you've, like, gained some muscle. It looks good. And I was like, you know. It's like, really? You think so? You know, it's just like, felt so good about myself. Like, it was like, this is great. You know what I mean? It's like, but it was the, the point that I'm trying to make. Okay? <laughs> Through that whole season, that month and a half or whatever it was that I was going consistently with Pat, I hated it. It was miserable. We'll use it as a silly example of a trial, okay? I hated every second of it. I felt like there was nothing good. Just pick things up, put them down. It's like there was nothing to it that I enjoyed. I was like, this is just bad. Like, there's nothing about this. But it wasn't until David said that, me, said that to me, it wasn't until I allowed somebody else's perspective to come in and tell me, here's what's actually happening. God has changed you. You're, 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 you're getting healthier. You're making healthier decisions. Like, you're changing. It's getting better. This is us in all the trials that we face. And it's what God wants to do is he wants us to see things in a different light. He wants us to, to, to drop the perspective that we have that the seasons, the trials that we're in are just hard, that they're just bad, that they're all negative things. And he wants to go, hey, I'm a God who turns a mess into a message. There's some good things in here. Take a step back, get a 30,000 foot view, choose my perspective and said, instead and see that I'm doing good things here. You guys follow me, church? God, we, we've got to change our perspective. We've got to let go of, of and, and hear me, I know that's not easy. Because it is, when things are hard, all we see, think, breathe, smell, it's, it's all hard. It's all trial. And God's saying, it doesn't have to be. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's not that your pain doesn't matter. But like, step outside for a second. Take a look in the mirror. Take a look at all the other things and hear my voice. Hear this truth that there's more to it than meets the eye. There's more to it than, just, than what you're just seeing right now. We've got to stop and get that different perspective. And what, 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 what's really happening here when we do that is we're allowing ourselves to, to receive that God is saying, hey, I'm empowering you here. We, we, it's back to that place of uh, like, let perseverance finish. It's right. we're, we're willing to go, okay, let me step back and say, God, you're doing more here than I can see. God, you're strengthening me. God, you're building me. God, you're renewing me. God, you're doing all these good things. Even though the, the world is crumbling around me, you're here with me and you're doing a good work. You are working inside of me and it's my job to step out of the way, take a different perspective and let God finish his work. Let God do what only he can do because have you tried to fix yourself before? I have. I'm bad at it. Real bad. That's why I'm not in the gym. That's why I'm back, back to stick figure mode. <laughs> We've got to get out of the way and let perseverance finish its work. What we're ultimately doing is we're learning to trust God. We're learning to go, okay, 
I'm going to step out, God. You do what only you can do. You do what only you can do. You fix me, God. You strengthen me. You give me all that I need. So again, point one, consider it pure joy because God is working in us. Amen? The next point we're going to read, okay? We're going to read through and then get our second point. Let's keep reading. Uh, Verse five is what we're picking up. Verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Hmm. Come on, James. So James goes on and he lets us know that in the midst of the trials, if we don't know what to do, if we're stuck and we can't figure it out, hey, here's good news. You can go ask God. You can ask God and he'll give it to you. But, but, when you go to God and you ask for that wisdom that he wants to freely give, when you, when you ask for his help that he wants to offer to you, just give it to you. You've got to 100% know that you are fully going to God. You have to make the decision to completely go to God and God alone. See, James goes on and uh, he talks about the wind, right? The waves and the, you're like a wave that's tossed around by the wind. So the point that I think James is trying to make is that so many times in life, we have so many other things that we like to, to put our hope in. We like to rely on. We, we like to expect that they would be a foundation for us if things just started to fall apart, that we could cling to them. And he's saying, hey, if you're going to go and ask God for that wisdom, if you're going to ask God for his help, he's got to be the only thing that you go and ask for help. You can't, you can't let all these other things sway you and make you believe that this is it or this is that. The things of the world will fail us. So again, point, point number two for this is we can rely on God. Consider it pure joy when you jump into a hard space and a hard season and a trial because you can rely on God in that season. N.T. Wright says this about, about the waves. He says, the challenge of faith is the challenge not to be a wave. There are many winds and tides in human life, and it's easy to imagine ourselves important because we seem, from time to time at least, to dance and sparkle this way and that. The challenge of faith is the challenge not to be a wave. We can rely on God, and not only can we rely on God, not only should we put our faith in Him, but we absolutely should with everything, always. He should be our go-to. He should be what we cling to. The other stuff, if we're being real, will always fail us, and that's hard because we invest in our stuff here. Come on. We, we, we think we've got to get all this other stuff. To, like, I've got, got to make sure this is all taken care of, my finances, my family. All, like, we like to, we got, we got to have the control. We've got to make sure that it's, everything's fail-proof, that everything's good. But in the end, it'll all fail us, except for God. We've got to rely on Him. He, James goes on to explain it in uh, verses 9 through 11. He says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. A lot of people read that, that section. They're like, so James is telling me I can ask God for help. And then he starts talking about rich and poor people. So he just might've had like a weird moment where he had a different, you know what I mean? Like kind of like just bounce around his mind. He's like, hey, ask God for help. Oh, there's nothing I want to talk to you about. You know, he just kind of like bounced around and added something else in the midst of it. It's not the case. This is all one big point that he's trying to push. And it's the point that we just talked about. It's the fact that as human beings, we think like the rich people, I've, I've got to make sure that I have all these things that I could potentially cling to. If things go wrong, I've, I've got to make sure, I've got to rely on myself. I've got to rely on my stuff. I've got to rely on this and that. And James is saying, hey, guess what? In the end, those things will fade away. And if you cling to those things, so will you. Don't hold on to those. They will fail you every single time. And so he's saying the people who are poor, the people that are, that are poor there, they, they've got this amazing opportunity because they don't have all those things to try and be tempted to cling to. Instead, they're just like, I got nothing. Hey, God. <laughs> but the rich have put themselves in a rough spot. And this isn't, he's not t- saying don't, don't make money. Don't. It's, not, it's not that deep of a thing. He's just saying rely on God and him alone because he will never fail you. He will always be a foundation that you can stand on that is firm, that is strong, that will never break away. He will never, ever, ever fail us. And a big piece of this 
that, that I think we struggle with, like, it's easy to say, hey, oh, you just got to rely on God, man. Just give it to God. And it's like, I, I get that that just is like, all right, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, right? But I think what's, what can help us to make that an easier thing, what helps us to say, no, I'm, I'm going to rely on God always with everything, is we need to understand who God is. It's a challenge to jump in and say, you tell me to rely on God, Pastor Ricky, but like, I know all these other things. I've been told other things in other churches about God, or I've experienced trials in my life. It's like, what about all that stuff? Like, who really is God? God is good. I'll tell you that today. God is good. And you have to know that. If you want to be able to hold on to him, because not only can we, but we should rely on God, you've got to learn who he is. You have to learn his nature. And back to that, that verse back there uh, in, in 5 through 8, James talks, he gives you some, some hints about who God is. He says, who gives, a God who gives generously, a God who is generous, who is giving, who's loving, without finding fault, he's, he's forgiving, he's full of grace and mercy. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that loves us and that we can love and be in relationship with. The more we know about him, the more we're able to, to understand who God is. And if we remind ourselves daily about that, remind ourselves, you are this, God. God, you are good. You are forgiving, graceful, loving, kind, merciful. When we remind ourselves about that, the easier it is to go, oh, no, I can rely on him. Because this is who he is. He is good. Come on, church. He is good. We've got to rely on God. We can. And isn't that in itself just a cool thing? We should. We need to be relying on God. But he gives us a choice to. And it's a gift is really what it is. It's like, man, I don't have to go into this season alone. I am not in this season alone. My God says, hey, I, I've gone before you. I am beside you and I'm behind you. And guess what? Let me fight this battle for you. Let me, let me help you through this hard place. Let me give you the strength that you need. Let me, we can rely on him. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things where like your big brother comes in, you know what I mean? Your dad comes in, you're like, I ain't got to do what my dad's going to do. He's just like carrying you through it. It's like, that's what God wants to do for us. He says, you, you can choose this. Let me do this for you. Rely on me and I'll never fail you. We have that choice and we got to get to know him to help us to rely on him. So again, first point, God is working in us. Second point is we can rely on God. And the third point, um, this one's a little bit of a different one, okay? And it's more of a continuation of the second one, um, but it's a little bit of a left turn. So the third point, I'm just going to tell you this straight up, is trials are opportunity for temptation. It's one thing we need to know. It's very important for us to understand and know about our trials is they are opportunity for temptation. Like, wow, Pastor Rick, I don't know how I'm supposed to consider that joy. <laughs> I know, but just stick with me because, again, it's so important for us to hear this. Um, and to explain it, I want to use an example from Scripture, a, a moment that Jesus had. So um, before his journey, his, his, his years of ministry, um, Jesus went to the desert, and he, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. That's crazy, y'all. You know what I mean? Like, y'all are fasted before. Come on. Like, we fasted. I fasted for three days before. No, <laughs> it's like... After like three days of fasting, I'm a monster. I'm hungry. You know what I mean? It's like, if I, that's what I'm doing, it's like, it's danger zone. You ask Rachel, I'm like, man, that looks good. <laughs> Just anything, you know? Um, it's hard. So imagine Jesus is in this spot where he goes out into the desert, into the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. This is huge because what he's doing is he's just, he's, he knows he's getting ready to do this ministry. He knows he's going to get out there and start doing miracles, and eventually it's going to lead to him saving the world. All this stuff, he's like, I got I to gotta rely on God. That's what he's doing. I got to get out there. I got to surrender this to God and just keep my eyes focused on him so I can be ready for this season. So he goes and does this, and what happens is, is while he's out there, he gets to the last, the, the, the end of his time out there, and the enemy shows up. Satan shows up. And what Satan does is he tempts Jesus three times in the midst of this really rough time for Jesus. Like, it's not that something bad has happened, but he is weak. Again, fully God. You're like, he's Jesus. He's like, yeah, fully God, also fully human. He hungry. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a, he's in a real spot of weakness right now. And so here's what happens. Okay? This is just kind of to summarize. So Satan shows up and he tempts Jesus three times. First time comes up to him and he says, hey, if you're God's son, there's some rocks right here, some stones, turn them to bread. You're so hungry, right? Turn to bread and eat them. Like, don't you, don't you, you gotta, you gotta eat, Jesus, it's good for you. Eat these. Jesus responds, it is written, man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Satan goes away. Then he comes back, right? He takes Jesus to the top of this temple 
And he says, hey, Jesus, if, if you're really God's son, you could jump, jump off the top of this temple. And scripture says, because he knows the word too, he says, scripture says angels will catch you, that the Lord will take care of you, that you won't even hit the ground. You won't hurt yourself at all. So jump. And Jesus says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then the third time, Satan takes Jesus up and he says, look at the world. Look at all of it. Look at this land. Every part of it, I'll give it to you. All the riches, all the stuff, it'll be yours. Just worship me. And Jesus responds, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So here's, here's what this is, okay? First thing I want us to see is that, again, it was in this very weak moment for Jesus that the enemy came in and tried to take advantage of him. He's at his lowest point. Again, he's there and he's, he's, he's just focusing on God. So you, you could argue he's in a very good place. But the enemy wants to do this thing to us where he, where he sees as a weak moment for us is an opportunity for, for him to come in and to destroy all the things that God is doing in our lives. He wants to come at us when we're at our lowest, when the trial is the hardest, when, when it's just hitting us and we're like, I just can't do this. And he's going, yeah, you can't give up. He wants to lie to us. He wants to twist it so that we will make the choice to just let everything that God's been doing, that work that he is doing, just go. He doesn't want us to move forward and become the people that God has called us to be. So he takes advantage of our weakness. He takes advantage of our trials and uses them for his benefit. This is what he said, uh, James says. He explains it well in verse 14 and 15. He says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The enemy wants to lie to you. Okay? Satan wants to deceive you and make you believe that the want that you have, Jesus was hungry. Oh, you, you probably want food, right? It's like, yeah, hey, well, guess what? I don't, you probably need that food. He wants to make you think. He wants to lie to you and make you believe that the want that you have is a need. Okay? He wants that desire to become a need. Because his ultimate goal is that you choose that desire and you disobey your heavenly father. Because he knows that if he can get you hooked on disobedience, that it will ultimately lead to death. You see that his little, how he works? He wants death. He wants the worst of the worst for us. And he will, man, will he lie in the midst of your trials. He will lie, lie, lie so hard that it almost feels like truth. You know, this last year um, during COVID, there was a, a pornography website that literally completely opened up their website for free to everybody for a few, like I think it was a few days or so. Um, and their, their reason for doing it, what they said, oh, we're, we're, we're giving everybody free access because of COVID. We want people to stay home so we can flatten the curve. Is that not the enemy? Is that not what he does as he comes in and goes, hey, really, you're helping. Do the right thing. Twist it so hard, church. We have to be aware of his plan. We have to know that he will use anything against us to get us off track of what God is doing in our hearts and our lives because he knows that God is good and that God is powerful and that if God takes control of our hearts and we make him Lord, oh man, there ain't no stopping it. We have to be aware. And again, like I said, it's a continuation because here's the good news, a continuation of that second point that we can rely on God because just like Jesus and because of Jesus, we too have the option and the opportunity to stand firm in our faith in the midst of our trial and in the midst of temptation. No matter how hard it is, no matter what lie the devil brings, we too can stand there, but we have to choose Jesus. We have to rely on God. We have to choose his strength over our own. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind and God is faithful. Can I get an amen? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God is faithful. 
God is there in the midst of our trials with us. And even when temptation comes, he's like, hey, I'm here. I'm still here. I'm not just there when things are rough and it's not your fault. Like when things get crazy and you're being tempted, I'm here. Here's a way out. Choose me. Choose my way. Choose Jesus. Because Jesus is the way. He is the way out. And it's available for us every single time. Temptation is, is we have an opportunity to respond to our temptations. And our response can be Jesus, but we have to make that choice. It's a choice that only we can make because he is the way out. It doesn't matter how, how bad the trial has gotten. It doesn't matter how, how heavy of a temptation is because, again, the enemy knows what our weaknesses are. All of us have different ones, and he knows what's really going to get us, and so he's going to use that. Again, at your weakest point, he's going to take you to the worst place. But again, the good news is it is nothing that our Heavenly Father can't help us stand up against. It is nothing that we can't overcome, nothing that we can't bear, because when we rely on God, we've been given victory. We sang that today. We talked about that today. We're living in victory already. Let's just walk it out. But we have to make the choice to rely on God. We have to make the choice to choose Jesus. Let's recap, okay, real quick. Trials are hard, and we don't like them. Amen? Sometimes we wish we could skip them, but we could fast forward through them and just go on autopilot and not have to deal with them, but that's just not the way. And we realize in the end that it wasn't anything helpful at all, and it's not what God's truth says we're called to do. God's truth says that we need to see these moments, these trials, these seasons, these opportunities, that we need to see them as, as not just good or not just bad. Don't do that. Not just bad but as good, that we consider them pure joy because God is working in us in those trials, because we can rely on him through every single part of it, and because although temptation is coming in and the enemy wants to use those seasons, what those really are, if we rely on God, is opportunity for growth, opportunity to stand strong and know, hey, God's got me through this before. No matter how hard the enemy hits, my heavenly father is going to help me stand strong. And so the next time it comes, I can keep going. It's going to get easier. I can keep going. I can keep going. And one day, I can stand strong in victory over those. They won't be a struggle like they were before. It's opportunity for growth. That's a lot. We've talked about a lot so far, but I've got a tiny bit more, okay? So just stick with me. What I want to do is I want to give you uh, a couple of practical steps because I think it's so important for us um, to, to, to leave on Sundays, to leave when, you, when we hear a message and not just hear it, but but go live it and, and go let God do that work in our lives. And so I want to give you a couple steps that I think you can take, that we can all take to help us in our pursuit of, of taking our trials, changing our perspectives and, and relying on God and letting these things become something that we consider pure joy because God is working in the midst of them. And so the, the, the two things that I have for you, the first one is um, we need to be open about our trials. We've got lots of things going on. And there's all these people in this room right now. There's all these people in your lives, in your homes. They're not there for, for nothing. They're not just there to be there, to exist. God has placed us in each other's lives so that we can help each other, so that we can love each other. God works through his people. And maybe there's a trial you're facing that somebody you know is facing. And maybe God has called you or that person, who, whatever way it may be, to help one another in that trial. Maybe God wants to use that person to glorify himself in this situation, to show you that he is with you, that he's helping you, providing for you. But we have to invite other people in. I, I know one thing I struggle with is if I'm going through something, I don't want to let people know that I'm struggling because I don't want it to be a burden to them. But if there's anything this last year that has taught us, this isolation is not the way. Doing it alone is not the way. We've got to invite others in. Sometimes that's how God works, is through his people. Let other people come in. Ask for help. Let them point you in the right direction and hold you accountable and just be there for you. We have to be open about our trials with each other. We have to be real. Because when we're real, the other thing that we're doing is, is we're setting up these blockades, this, this defense, so that when an enemy comes, tries to tempt us in the midst of our trials, we're going, hey, I know my friend knows I'm in this situation, so he's checking on me. He's, hey, man, how is, how is this going? Because I don't. I, the enemy might try to come get me, and I can go, hey, it's rough right now, and really I'm feeling tempted to just give up or I'm tempted to do something I haven't just to feel some pleasure for a little bit. It's like he's like, hey, that's not it. God's going to speak through. That's not it. We have to be open and real about our trials. And the second thing is to seek the truth. In our, in our trials, the enemy's goal is to tell us that it's too much. 
and the things that we face, it's, his goal is to lie to us again and twist it so hard that it almost feels like truth. So the only way to tell if something is a lie is to know the truth. And the truth is the word. God's word gives us the truth. And so our job as followers of Jesus is to be listening to God's voice, to be hearing the truth that he wants to speak into our lives. When Satan showed up to Jesus, each time he responded, it is written. He said, hey, here's the truth about the lie you just told me, Satan. Get out of here. Because my heavenly father has told me the truth. Don't you want to be in that spot? Don't we want to be in that spot? We've got to dig into God's word. We've got to get to it and say, God, what is the truth? God, I'm going through a season, God. And I'm going to be real with you, God. I'm feeling tempted. And God's going to say, well, here's the truth about those lies that you're believing right now. Here's the truth about those lies that are swirling around in your head. Respond with truth. Choose the truth. It's available to us in every situation, in every circumstance. And one day we're going to be able to, we're going to be put in a situation through a trial and a temptation and God's going to remind us of that truth. And we're going to be able to stand strong because we're not relying on ourselves, relying on him and his truth. We've got to seek it. We have to prioritize it. It's got to be a part of, of the everyday life. We're not perfect at it, but we have to pursue it. We have to seek it. Can you guys stand with me? So before we close, I just want to tell you um, just kind of something personal. Is when I was uh, younger, I want to say about seven years old, um, uh, there was a day where my mom came to me and um, her and my, my, real, my biological father had, had gotten divorced and it was like going to, you know, back and forth, that kind of deal, to see them. And one day my mom called me into a room. We were living with some friends and we all shared this really big room in their house. Uh, and she called me in and she called me in to tell me, hey, um, your dad has been um, sentenced to 50, 57 years in prison. And um, so basically, buddy, you're not going to see him anymore. And so, I mean, I, I was younger and it took some time, but I got that. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, I, I can remember today, like before my dad went away, to me, he was a good dad. He, lo he loved me. He did a lot of other things really wrong, but I know he loved me. So that was hard, you know? It's like he was my superhero and he's gone. And so when she told me that, I mean, I couldn't do anything but cry. You know what I mean? I just broke down, just tears, just, just flooding. It's hard. And we sat, my mom and I sat in that room and she started crying too. And, and, and we, we cried for hours, y'all. Like, I don't know how, how, how we cried that much, but we did. And it was hard. I, that, that's what I remember. Is like in that moment, all I knew was, I don't like this. This is hard. And as I got older, and as I was getting ready for this message, truthfully, I, I was able to look back on that and to see that time, that night that my mom just sat, my mom and I sat in that room and we cried together but it was different because I didn't just see it as hard. What I saw instead, I didn't just see it as, as, as my dad was gone. I didn't just see it as like that, that was awful. But what I saw instead is I saw my mom and I saw her holding me and crying with me and telling me it's gonna be okay and letting me know that she was gonna be there for me and that she was gonna fight for me and she was gonna take care of me and that I had nothing to worry about she was there if there's anything that you can leave with today and you may have been told this a thousand times but I need to tell you a thousand and one that in your hardest times in every season no matter how rough it gets God is there God loves you God wants to hold you God wants to take care of you. He wants to let you know that he's gonna provide for you. He wants to remind you how important you are to him. He just wants to cry with you. He wants to tell you he understands about your pain. He's there. And he's given us the option to rely on him. He's given us the option to say, hey, it's, I don't have to do this alone. He's saying, hey, let me fight this battle for you. Let me, let me lead you. Let me just take, let me carry you through this. 
We just have to make the choice. But just know that He is there, that in your hard seasons, you are not alone. He loves you. He loves you so, so much. And He wants to fight for you. So let's let Him. Because when we let Him, we can consider a pure joy. We can keep moving and we can let Him finish the work He's begun. Let's pray, church. Jesus, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for your love. God, I thank you that in our hardest moments, God, when we are broken and and we feel like we're at nothing, that you are holding us. God, that you are crying with us. God, I thank you for the people who represent you in our lives. God, the people who love us that way, God, because sometimes that's what you do, God, is you use other people to show us your love, Lord. And so right now, Lord, I just pray that we allow others to surround us, God, that whatever our trials are, God, that we invite you in, God. We invite you in so that we can get through them, God, so that so that the work you started can continue to finish, God, so we can rely on you and not ourselves and so that we can stand firm when the enemy tries to tell us that we're not enough, when he tries to bring his lies, God, so we can know your truth. We love you and we thank you, God. Move in our hearts, God. We invite you in. It's in your perfect and matchless name we pray, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Church.